representation of Goethe's first incompleteness theorem in computational type theory. Benjamin. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, my talk is called Goethe's Theorem Without Tears. This is joint work with Dominic Kirst, and we did this while I was working on my bachelor's thesis at Professor Smolka's chair. Gödel's first incompletist theorem can be stated as that any effective, consistent, and sufficiently powerful formal logic is incomplete. And today, we'll consider proofs of this incompletist theorem that was originally proven by Gödel. In particular, our proofs are going to be abstract. That is similar to, that is, our proofs are going to be uh, not one monotonous proof, but instead we are going to attempt to factorize these proofs into different parts to really figure out what the essence of incompleteness is in our case. Something similar has been done by Popesco and Treitel, who attempted to factorize Gödel's <coughs> original incompleteness proof and its strengthening um, into, for example, the arithmetical requirements and other properties of the formal systems in play. Now we're going to use a different proof approach than the one that was originally taken by Gödel and the one that has been factorized by Pesco and Treitel. There's a very well-known proof of incompleteness that uses the halting problem. It is well-known enough to be taught in many basic computer science courses and it essentially relies on the undecidability of the halting problem. It has been discovered independently by Pliny, Turing and as well as Post. Now, when attempting to formalize these proofs using computability theory, uh, it turns out that this can get quite annoying when working with a concrete model of computation. And we've already heard a few talks yesterday that used synthetic computability to formalize results in computability theory. And we're going to do this again today, which allows us to really um, remove all of the tedium that comes with incompleteness results, uh, that complete, comes with computability theory results. Something similar with relation to the incompleteness theorems has already been done by Christian Thermes. Now, this proof using the halting problem of incompleteness does not give us proof uh, as strong as it could be. In particular, Gödel's proof from 1931 has been strengthened a few years later by Rosser. And while the proof using the halting problem due to Kleene, Turing, and Post is uh, as strong as Gödel's, its result is not as strong as Rosser's. And Rosser's way of strengthening Gödel's result does not immediately apply to the approach using, the, using computability theory. However, Kleene did find a way to change his proof to use another problem from computability theory than the halting problem to get a stronger result. And as many others that have already done this, we've machine checked all of our results and obtained a full proof of incompleteness that way. Yes, they, they, it's, it's yeah. moving a bit. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, um, to get a quick look at what the history of these arguments <coughs> look like, Gödel proved in 1931 uh, that his first incompleteness theorem, and in particular, if we take a look at the statement up here, uh, the main point where this statement can be strengthened is on the requirements of the formal system we showed to be incomplete. In particular, this requirement of consistency here has, uh, was originally stronger. That is, we, uh, Gödel's original proof did not show incompleteness of all consistent, effective, and sufficiently powerful formal logic, but just of omega consistent formal logic. For now, you can think, think of omega consistency as a restricted form of soundness. This is not going to be important for today. Kleene's early approach were, uh, is also assumes a form of soundness. And as I said, a few years after Gödel published his result, Rosa found a way to strengthen it using a certain trick modifying the provability predicate used by Gödel. Similarly, Kleene was able to strengthen his proof to use recursively inseparable predicates instead of the halting problem to also find a strengthened proof of incompleteness that assumes consistency. However, this proof 
can not immediately be applied to, for example, uh, first order arithmetic. To do this, we are actually able to apply Rosser's trick to be able to instantiate this strengthened proof due to cleaning. Interestingly, this strengthened proof of incompleteness using computability theory is a lot less well known than one might would expect. We only found out about these results through an email by Anatoly Vorobey on the Foundations of Mathematics mailing list. And even though this result is uh, very simple and considerably more general than the one using the halting problem, it is, very, uh, it is not very well known. Uh, we factorized both of these proofs due to Cleany uh, into two parts. First, a very concise abstract core, which we formalized using synthetic computability. And secondly, an instantiation of these abstract proofs to first order arithmetic by using Rosser's trick. We'll first consider these abstract incompleteness proofs. In particular, we'll first talk about this early incompleteness result due to Cleany, then how to strengthen this result, and finally, how to actually obtain the strongest incompleteness result. Then we're quickly going to talk about the instantiation. You've already heard a bit about synthetic computability yesterday. Uh, we'll work in the calculus of con inst inductive constructions, that is the type theory underlying the Cock proof assistant. This is a constructive type theory where all functions can be considered computable. This allows us to very concisely define some notions from computability theory. For example, we say that a predicate on a type X is decidable if there's a function from X to the booleans such that P of X holds if and only if f of x is equal to true. Similarly, we say that a predicate is semi-decidable if there is a function from x that takes some input x and a natural number as a step index and returns a boolean such that p of x holds if and only if there is a step index k such that f of x of k is true. This crucially relies on the fact that we can interpret this function space to only, con to only contain computable functions. Now we also need a notion of what we consider such a formal logic, a formal system to be. A formal system will consider to contain a type S of, uh, a discrete type S of sentences, where discrete means that equality on this type is decidable. It contains a negation function as well as, an as a semi-decidable provability predicate. Whenever I talk about, for example, an effective formal system, this is the requirement we're talking about. We need probability to be semi-decidable. We also require this formal system to be consistent. <coughs> that is, require that there is, if for any sentence, we cannot both prove this sentence and refute it. We call such a formal logic complete if every sentence can either be proven or refuted. For these, um, many formal logics uh, are formal systems in this sense, for example, first order logic over any consistent and effective axiomatization, but also uh, type theories such as CIC and essentially everything you would want is a formal system in this sense. We can now show that there is a partial function similar to what Yannick did yesterday. We're not going to consider partial functions in detail um, you can think of these as step index total functions, but the details are not going to matter. And we can show that there is a partial function from the sentences into the booleans that separates provability from refutability. That is, df of s returns true if and only if, f, uh, if, and only if s is provable, and df of s returns false if and only if s is refutable. Now our formal system, uh, if our formal system is complete, Every sentence can either be shown or refuted, and this function is going to be total. <coughs> On the other hand, if there is a sentence that is independent in our formal system, that is a sentence that can neither be proven nor refuted, this function df is going to diverge on this sentence. We can now show that in any complete formal system, that is a formal system with a total function df, uh, probability is decidable because this function df in that case happens to be a decider for probability. And this already suffices to give a very weak incompleteness proof. Um, we assume 
our formal system F to be complete. And to, to say what it means for our formal, formal system to be powerful enough, we say that our formal system weakly represents a predicate P. That means that there is a representation functions from the natural numbers into the sentences, such that P of X holds if and only if R of X is provable. If we have this, then P is decidable because our formal system F is complete. Therefore, provability, provability is decidable. And since uh, decidability transfers across equivalences, P must also be decidable. This can also, uh, R can also be seen as a many one reduction from provability to our predicate P. Now, why is this a form of incompleteness? We can extend the statement a bit. Um, if we assume that our predicate P is undecidable, then we know our formal system F is incomplete. This is the form of incompleteness that has been formalized by Kirsten Hermes. However, we are not quite able to instantiate this proof yet, because in CIC, without additional assumptions, there are no undecidable predicates. Because, in fact, it is consistent to assume that every synthetically decidable predicate, uh, that every predicate is synthetically decidable. What we can do to mitigate is this, we, want to, we can internalize the notion that all functions are computable. We do this uh, by assuming a form of Church's thesis. In particular, we're going to assume a form called EPF, that stands for enumerability of partial functions. Similar axiom is originally due to Richmond in a paper called Church's thesis without tears. Um, uh, this, uh, EPF states that there is a function theta from the natural numbers into the partial function space from net to bool, such that for any such function, we can find a code C such that F is extensionally equal to theta C. Intuitively, this means that this function theta is universal for all functions in this function space. We can now define the self-holding problem as that given an x, theta x of x evaluates to some Boolean B. And we're in fact able to show that this self holding problem is undecidable. We are going to show a slightly stronger and more informative statement than just undecidability. We're going to show that any partial function from net to bool that agrees with the halting problem, that is, x is an h if and only if f of x evaluates to true, must diverge on some input c. This looks a lot closer to typical undecidability if we instead state that there is no total functions from the natural numbers to the booleans that agree with the halting problem. The proof of the statement is very similar to the classical textbook proof of the undecidability of the halting problem. Um, we construct some function g um, in this case, and then we consider the code relative to this axiom of EPF of this function g and use this code to derive a contradiction. Essentially, we can consider this Church's thesis as containing a form of goodization of all our functions. And with this strengthened form of undecidability of the halting problem, we're now able to show an actually incompleteness result. Um, we assume that our formal system F weakly represents the halting problem. That is, there is, again, such a representation function R. Uh, in that case, F has an independent sentence. That is, a sentence that can neither be proven nor refuted. To show this, we construct a function from our partial decider for probability DF and compose this with a representation function R. This new function, DF after R, agrees with the halting problem and as we've just shown, this function d of us after r must therefore diverge on some input c. However, if d f after r diverges on some input c, d f diverges on some input r of c, and our decider for probability will only diverge for, for sentences that can neither be proven nor refuted, and therefore our c is independent in f. We've now been able to formalize um, an incompleteness proof, 
an abstract incompleteness proof very compactly, and because of our use of synthetic computability theory and Church's thesis, we've been able to do this without taking any form of shortcut, as would have, for example, been done in a textbook where we have to talk about, for example, composition of Turing machines. Now let's consider weak representability again. In particular, weak representability contains a form of soundness. We have this direction from the right to the left, where we want to have a proof uh, of uh, property in our meta theory from a probability statement within our formal system. <coughs> However, to actually obtain the strongest incompleteness results we can, we do not want our incompleteness results to apply to a certain formal system, but also to all of its extensions. An extension is of a formal system is a formal system with the same type of sentences and the same negation function, but a larger probability predicate. Unfortunately, weak representability only transfers along extensions that preserve the soundness direction. Uh, that, uh, however, that is sound extensions. Not all extensions of formal systems are able to preserve this. Not all extensions are sound. We have unsound extensions of formal system. And we now must, might ask ourselves, can we do better? Can we find another form of representability that still suffices to show incompleteness, but is not too strong to prevent us from instantiating it? And yes, in fact, there is such a form of representability that is strong separability. We say that the formal system F strongly separates two predicates P1 and P2 if we have a representation function R such that if P1 is provable, R of X is provable, and if P2 is provable, uh, uh, holds, then R of X is refutable. Now, before we get to a proof <coughs> of incompleteness, we need to consider another problem from computability theory, then a halting problem that is recursively inseparable predicates. We consider the following two predicates, I true and I false, that they define us that theta x of x evaluates to true or false, respectively. These two predicates are recursively inseparable. That is, uh, for any partial functions from the natural numbers to the booleans, such that if x is in I true, f of x evaluates to true, and x is in I false, then f of x evaluates to false, must diverge on some input. This can intuitively be seen as that there's no interpreter for, um, for evaluation that does not diverge everywhere. Proving this is very similar to the proof that the Horton problem is undecidable. We construct a certain function, get, it, get its code from our assumption of EPF, and use this to derive a contradiction. Now using this, we're actually able to show Kleene's improved incompleteness proof. We assume that our formal system F strongly separates I true and I false. That is, as was we said, there's a such a representation function. And now this formal system F must have an independent sentence. Very similarly to the proof before, we show this by constructing a function that recursively separates I true and I false. This makes this function diverge, which induces an independent sentence. Now, as we talked about, we also want this statement to apply to all consistent extensions of our formal system F. And that does in fact hold, because all extensions of F are still going to prove R of X and refute R of X in all of the cases where it's supposed to. This allows us to also apply complete, uh, incompleteness to all of the extensions of any formal system that recursively separate I true and I false. This form of incompleteness of all consistent extensions is called essential incompleteness. Now we'll get to instantiating these abstract incompleteness results to concrete first order logic. In particular, we're going to consider first order arithmetic in the form of Robinson arithmetic. Robinson arithmetic is essentially a weaker form of piano arithmetic without any form of induction. From now on, we need to assume theta in our assumption of our, the enumerability of partial functions 
to be an interpreter for mu recursive functions. We need to do this because if we just assume this theta to be uh, some abstract object, it might be an interpreter for a form of computation that is not Turing complete, that is more powerful than Turing completeness. For example, Turing machines with an oracle for the halting problem. However, if theta would represent such a model of computation, we would not be able to represent its computations within Robinson arithmetic. So we need to assume this model to be Turing complete, and we essentially chose mu recursive functions arbitrarily. We could have also chosen, for example, Turing machines. We're now going to rely on existing results that show that there's an even weaker theory than Robinson arithmetic that weakly represents any semi-decidable predicate, such as the halting problem, using a sigma one formula in this weaker form if in, in this even weaker form of Robinson arithmetic. This result was shown by Christ and Hermes, heavily relying on a mechanization of the DPRM theorem by Leischer, Wendling, and Foster. The question is now, can we find a theory that also strongly separates our predicates I true and I false, or more generally, that strongly separates any disjoint and semi-decidable predicates? And the answer is yes, Robertson arithmetic suffices to do this. Robertson arithmetic is strong enough to strongly separate any pair of semi-decidable and disjoint predicates. To show this, we assume two predicates P1 and P2 that are semi-decidable, and we know that these are weakly representable by a sigma-1 formula. That is, it is some form of existential formula, and we now exploit this existential quantifier in this formula by choosing a new formula that fulfills certain disjointness properties. And with this result, we're able to show that Robinson arithmetic is essentially incomplete. That is, any extension of Robinson's Q that is consistent has an independent sentence. Just as a comparison point, the statement shown by Kirsten Thermes is that any, any sound extension of Q that is complete induces a decider for some undecidable problem, such as the holding problem for Turing machines. To summarize, we gave abstract incompleteness proofs to Tuclini in different strengths using synthetic computability and instantiated those proofs to first order Robertson arithmetic using Ross Ostrick. We relied on libraries of undecidability and first order logic as well as a certain first order proof mode by Koch. We've mechanized all of these results. In particular, the strongest form of the abstract incompleteness results can be, some, can be written down in only 200 lines of standalone Koch code. In total, our development, including its dependencies, consists of roughly 160,000 lines of code. Um, okay, for future work, we're interested in checking whether we can find a form of Church's thesis for Robertson arithmetic using it as a model of computation, whether we can do the abstract proofs for a concrete model of computation, whether we can avoid DPRM as a dependency to reduce our code count, and prove Gödel's second incompleteness theorem. Thank you. So, are there questions? that this trick uh, that you mentioned causes some problem with the, the probability predicate that you, I think you cannot get fixed points anymore or something, you don't get this general fixed point result. Uh, I forget now what the details were. Um, uh, it som somehow it made it less modular, so to speak, the, the proof. Um, this is, I'm not sure what uh, this original strengthening by Russell looks like, but in our setting, it does not cause any problems at all because we've been able to factorize all of the incompleteness proofs into computability theory. Okay. Yeah, because there is this approach using probability logic, which is a form of modal logic, which actually gives very concise proofs of, uh, of the incompleteness theorems, but I think it doesn't work with, the, with this trick. I'm, I don't remember anymore. It would probably be interesting to consider whether we are able to use this probability logic with our approach to incompleteness. No, indeed, that would be nice, okay. yes. <laughs> so 
one more question, maybe last question. Um, hi. Uh, it seems unclear whether uh, Gödel second incompleteness theorem can be applied to CIC because of the universe hierarchy and stuff like that. Do you think your work can help moving towards a formal proof that we also have a, an indecidability uh, formal theorem on CIC? Um, I think that our result would actually, at least on paper, relatively easy apply to CIC because we only need that CIC on some form of meta level weakly or strongly represents these two predicates. That is, it is able to argue about computation and it is definitely able to do that. It's stronger than Robertson arithmetic. And therefore we can easily obtain incompleteness and even though I haven't talked about this today, undecidability of CIC. Okay, so let's... Uh 